keep all our presentations somehow related to the legacy of Helen and Scott. And tonight's obviously about homesteading and about yurts and the root of the yurt. And our yurts, we have three yurts on this property, is a man named Bill Copperthwaite um, that Melanie and Josh were very influenced by. So I'm going to turn it over to them and uh, I want to thank you for coming and participating. Thank you very much. All right, go for it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. <clears throat> this is our first time ever speaking about our, uh, our lifestyle and yurts in general, so we're not polished, you know, we're, we're kind of doing this because Warren asked, and, <laughs> and this is the place where it kind of started for us. We, um, oh, how do you want to start? Do you want to start? It's a good time to figure that out. Yeah, we should figure that out. Um, we figured we would start, um, we, in July of 2011, seven years ago, we, um, Josh's mom, we were visiting her, she lives in Sullivan, and she grew up in Ellsworth, and her, that side of his family is um, from MDI. And so we were visiting her in Sullivan. We were living in New Hampshire at the time. And um, she said, I think you guys would be really interested in, in this place. And we had, we had never heard of the nearings. Um, there was nothing in our life that was remotely <laughs> we were connected to the nearings. We were very so, not the nearings. <laughs> so we visited. Like and mm. so I took lots of pictures of things. Um, <coughs> The, the gardens, the ferry trail, and we we happened to um, go out to the yurt. We'd never seen a yurt before, um, and we weren't really sure what to think of the yurt, but I didn't even take a picture of it. It was that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is this? I don't know. And um, But on the bench in, in the yurt was Bill Copperthwaite's book, and um, at the time, we again didn't even really pay attention to it. I thought it was something for crafts people, which is not at all what we were. So um, we had this experience and then we went home to our life in New Hampshire and um, to, tr how we to try to, I don't know <laughs> how to like fully encapsulate what our life was, but um, <laughs> so we lived in a cul-de-sac with a about five pages of rules, including like, you know, chickens, your lawn had to be a certain way, and on and on. We had four TVs, and we finished our basement to put an even bigger TV in the basement. Um, I worked a very corporate, you know, went blow dried my hair, makeup, and <laughs> Starbucks frappuccino on my way to the office in the morning. Um, well, Josh, he was watching Sports Center first thing, and going, he owned a restaurant, and and at this stage in our life, we just had this little guy, who's now that little guy. <laughs> and we had started down the path of gardening. Um, some things had brought us... Um, well, yeah, first, um, before we got to the gardening, we had n no connection really to food. We, we spent a lot of time eating out at restaurants because we worked so much. And yeah. um, it was only when we had this little guy that um, suddenly this whole world that we live in was topsy-turvy because um, these pictures get even <laughs> more comical when you see the pictures of where we're at now well yeah so Kaden was very colicky which was a big wake-up call for us because um, in we didn't eat well well but it was kind of like what everyone else was doing around us and everyone else was having babies and still maintaining this perfection that we weren't able to maintain and all of a sudden we were just like in the trenches and totally isolated and it made us start really looking at our food um, because that was clearly what was going on and once we started adjusting our food, things really changed. Um, actually, I remember talking to you about this. <laughs> um, and so then, as Josh was saying, um, we ended up we doing the garden. A, a CSA first, which we had never heard about, which and then failed. it failed. So we're like, okay, maybe we can grow our own food. And so we did this in the back of our cul-de-sac, our little tiny um, cul-de-sac house. We and we're like, oh, we can do this. Then. A little <laughs> tiny garden. Um, and, you know, we were starting, like in this area, we were starting to plant raspberries, and we were using this one little space to the maximum that we could possibly use it. Our septic took up the rest of our um, our space, our front yard, we couldn't build on it, it was all rock, we couldn't garden at all, and 
we couldn't have chickens, we couldn't have clotheslines, you know, there was so many things that we just couldn't do that we finally decided that maybe we should look at leaving. Yeah, and there was a couple other things that, you know, as the, we, we got involved in the Waldorf School um, in that area, and it kind of, again, opened our eyes to a different way of you know, education and just being. And at that Waldorf School, they recommended reading the Simplicity Parenting, which, again, really opened our eyes to the way we were living in terms of media and stuff and um, things that we had no context for um, before. And so then we, we had decided to move before we came to the Good Life Center visit. And so we moved up to Sullivan because um, we were trying to sell our house in New Hampshire and it wasn't selling. So we moved up to Josh's mom's to wait for the house to sell. And um, we tried to continue gardening in the field nearby just to maintain a little bit of that. We had garlic that we had grown for two years, and we were determined to keep that garlic going. <laughs> <laughs> we just dug up these trenches, put in soil, and had these really terrible small heads of garlic at the end of it. But, <laughs> um, it but okay. our whole plan when we decided to move was to build a timber frame mm. house. Not actually us. We no. had no, no, no experience <laughs> building. And we, like we had the basement finished in our previous house, and we tried to do it ourselves, but like. We gave, we gave up yeah. <laughs> and just hired people yeah. and um, so we were we were working with a timber framer in Blue Hill and just waiting for our house in New Hampshire to sell so we could proceed with this beautiful timber frame house which felt like where we wanted to head um, and in the meantime Bill's book came up again and I don't remember how but it came up again when we came home in some conversation I'm like oh, I, I should get this and see what this is and we started reading it and um, I can't even explain. We, we just would share passages back and forth. It was completely um, resonant and revolutionary <laughs> for us. And we'd had no, um, how many people have read this? Like, mm -hmm. Do you have a, yeah. Um, and um, so, so, so much of it was about making, building things yourself and and being able to even make your own home even if you have no experience. And as we continued to drop the price of our New Hampshire house, um, mm -hmm. I ended up um, asking Josh if he thought maybe we could build a yurt. And I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I said absolutely not. Um, At the time, too, a little back to that is, um, this cute little thing I couldn't even hold in my left hand because I had so much pain in my wrists because of um, what I did for work. And uh, I went to the specialist everywhere, you know, down in the area of Mass General. Every specialist had a different reason why my wrist hurt and I couldn't use it. And um, I don't think this is a picture. See, she can see the pictures, so she's Sorry. getting ahead of me. Um, but then also when we moved up here about this time, we found Dr. Curtin who in three visits fixed my wrist. Without that happening, none of what you're gonna see from here on out was even possible. I mean, she as a you know, 15 pound child was too much for my hand, so. Yes, the idea of building something. The idea of building something was just, it, I was like, no, like how, how is this even possible? Yeah. Um, but um, but we, we continued to both read the book and we were just kind of blown away with the whole idea that you could live this way in this um, in this day and age and um, it fascinated us and I have a bunch of quotes that I love and I was going to share but I, I don't know that we have the time but it's so much about you know what television like thinking about television thinking about one's work in the world and um, schooling and, um, and simplicity and it was just so powerful for us at this really big transitional time um, and if we had time at the end, I would love to come back and read some of these. And even that Bill was inspired by the Mongolian yurts, like he, you know, just to see this older gentleman when we had, you know, grandparents who really were not very inspiring um, at that stage, just to see this older man who was just so full of possibility and, and, and hunger to learn. He was still yeah. learning. Um, in many of our visits, he would 
bring us the next thing that he had just made, um, you know, a bowl out of horn that he had put to the right temperature and rolled out. Um, he just was still wanting to learn, and and uh, that was that was pretty powerful. And then just seeing all of the yurts at that point, just all the possibilities of what a yurt could be, and um, we just started to get excited about it, especially once Josh's hands were feeling better, and and then as our house continued to drop in price and we're like what if we can't afford this timber frame house like what are we doing we're going to just be working so much to be able to afford this house and it's starting to not make any sense um and so in the back of bill's book um he said i welcome visitors and here's the here's where you find me and we're like oh well maybe we just go write visit me a letter <laughs> write me a letter and so we wrote him a letter and asked to come visit and um you the only way to reach him was um found a mile and a half trail or a canoe he was we chose a the mile star. and a half trail we, yep and, but it was december <laughs> um here. that we um found our way to the trail and um and it was very cool <laughs> but yeah. it was just pure magic to to walk out there and see them <coughs> just appear and also see not only did he live what the book was but there even more so it was just so powerful to see such authenticity um, mm -hmm. and every time we would visit there would be often something going on in the workshop and that very first time there was and I don't remember what it was but um, that very first time can't quite see him but there was also this man named Kenneth that we met who for some reason in all of our visits <laughs> Kenneth would also be there visiting um, by coincidence. And so that first time Bill totally took us right in. My daughter Aria had fallen asleep in my back and he's like, oh, let me take your, your baby. <laughs> and he was um, just, I don't even know how yeah. to describe And I really appreciated that um, <laughs> our, you know, mm -hmm. after like three minutes of nice to meet you, how you doing? And he goes, so what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and I just appreciated that forwardness of like, why are you here? And we just went, we want to live in one of these. And he made this great sound where he went, oh! <laughs> and like, and it caught his attention. And, you know, he was looking at us and like we saw in that picture before, we were very not yurt people. Mm. Like what people would think of as a, somebody that would live in a yurt. And um, I don't, I still, in the, I would love to ask him today if I could, but I think he took it as a challenge. Mm. <laughs> and, um, he, he, what do you mean? <laughs> and he, uh, he took us in, and that was the start of our path. Yeah. And so he, he took us around, and he just showed us the whole property, and it was, um, it was mine. All the yurts. Yeah. And there's, and I think there's nine mean? of them on the property, um, including the outhouses. It is big there. And this Aria, we always talk about this when she danced on the table the first time. So this is for Aria. <laughs> this is when you dance on the table. Um, and we were all just like totally captivated by like everything <laughs> that was around us. And, and I guess at, at this point too, it's interesting to note the hats that the kids have on are all stuff that I knitted because um, I had started. Um, I, I had started knitting, taking a, a um, from the Waldorf school. Um, through all the details, but I really got into knitting, and that was kind of my first mm -hmm. kind of experience with craft and how powerful it was to make things myself mm -hmm. instead of having to go buy, you know, even clothing. And um, mm -hmm. so everybody in my family got hats pretty quick, <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's some other pictures in here, but um, I just noticed that I remember making that hat. So, so pretty much once we made this decision to build the year and Bill said yes let's figure this out we um, mm -hmm. found the land and our house was sold and mm -hmm. suddenly everything was mm -hmm. kind of released um, and so um, that's the land that we found and um, mm -hmm. also in this as we were waiting for this someone mentioned you should read this back from the land book has anyone read this this was um, I'm so thankful <laughs> for this. It was this. Um, it was a book about um, how so many people went um, back to the land with the nearing movement and everything, and how they um, went back again to the mainstream, and why. 
um, how so many of them ended up back in the mainstream. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of it had to do with kind of growing in completely and dealing with poverty and you know, some, one of the stories was like spending the whole day and coming up with like one quarter cup of ketchup from the whole day of work and having to work in menial jobs to try to piece it together. And um, I think what this book did for us was really make us really want to try to move more into being more connected with the land, but not um, not make not move so fast that it wasn't sustainable. We didn't want to be totally self-sufficient yeah. at that point and just kind of cut off all of our ties to the mainstream economy and um, and just it just made it possible for us because we knew we were going to have to have some sort of debt um, mm -hmm. at some point. So well, and um, so many people in this book talked about their back to the land time being the most wonderful time of their life, and yet they were not doing it anymore. And it was just seemed like this, you know, why, <laughs> why give up? <laughs> and mm. so we just um, keep that in the back of our mind. We still do. Mm. Um, so Bill came to the land, and he walked around with us, and mm. I love the ticker, like we had so much, you know, we're in both worlds. Um, so much and so Bill like late he's like lay down on the land and like see how it flows like to figure out where you're going to site your house. And, and these were buckets that we were <laughs> we were putting in certain That's spots so, so that we could kind of judge like well if we did it here what would it look like and we were trying to make circles and anyhow. At some point we realized that where Bill is laying where he said this you know like look at this look what this feels like that's about actually where the center of our home it's pretty much the dead center of our <laughs> um, home it's, it's right there um, yeah. and it also gives you a good I mean the whole thing gives you an idea also of what when you see the pictures of what our land looks like now this is where our house is yeah this is the driveway that they're on right now that was an old road um, but the other two pictures are, it was all, it was 17 acres of wood um, in Sedgwick that we ended up. And so then we started working on the land and we had um, friends and we had only lived here for a year, but um, they, friends that we had met started coming and helping um, with burn piles and such. And we were coming back and forth from Sedgwick and we had some excavator help. To we were going from Sullivan to Sedgwick. This, you know, this was a, quite a ride, you know, trying to find the time because Melanie was still working. She works remotely, so she was still working. Caden was in kindergarten, so he had school until noon, and then Aria was home with me. I was a stay-at-home dad. So we were trying to piece together, trying to mm -hmm. work our land with all of that happening at the same time. Yeah, and I should say that, so I work, I, I still have my corporate job. I work from home, and mm -hmm. we kind of try to juggle the, um, Bill was also really big on education and love of learning and for us that is totally expressed in our Waldorf experience. But our Waldorf experience also costs money and so we live in this world of trying to piece all these values together in, in the way that um, we best can. And so we cleared the land and then we also, we decided to put up um, a fabric gear so that we could be on the land and start getting things ready. And we were ready to be, just be there. Um, so we didn't know anything about building anything still. So we had um, White Mountain Yurts come and they built the deck and they, they put it up. Um, and so that was September of 2012. That was a year after we had moved up to Maine. So then we had a home base, and then I started um, a blog because nobody from our previous life could understand <laughs> what in the world we were doing. <laughs> so I started like, this is this is what we're doing in pictures because I we just couldn't explain it, and it, again we wouldn't have understood it before. So right when we moved in, Bill also sent us a letter saying, "Hey, we are re-roofing the Good Life Center. <laughs> You're come help." and I'll help give you experience for building yours. And Aria was really excited about yeah, it. very excited. <laughs> and so, so we came, even though we're still in the middle of like trying to like move and get set up. Um, and, um, <coughs> so, so here, you know, this is our first time working on any year. Um, 
she said, no, uh, Tony, I, were you here for this? I, yeah. there, there were some people here, Lauren was here. Um, but the, one of the most important things that happened for us was Bill had said you need to meet Mike, Mike Iacona, um, who is now the person in charge of all the year plans. And he does, he, he leads the year building workshops whenever anybody asks now. Um, he's a wonderful person. And um, we kind of, I don't remember at what point, but Bill was starting to pull back. Yeah, so Bill had been diagnosed with um, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Yeah, and so we were all feeling this pressure, and he was feeling like this big, huge yurt that we decided on was maybe a bit too much um, to take on himself. So he was trying to convince Mike to help. He was giving us names of people um, who we now know all of. They're all part of our Dickinson's Reach community that helps take care of Bill's land. But on the top of the list was Mike and. I can't remember exactly when, but at some point in here, Bill had asked Mike if he would lead our workshop. Or at least one of them, because it would be two two-week workshops. And um, Mike said no. Mike said he would, didn't feel like he was ready to take on something that big. He only led a small workshop in Italy, and um, and probably not much bigger than this. And um, so Mike had said no. And so we had met Mike and his wife Nika, and we had a wonderful time roofing the year. It was so fun. Yeah, <laughs> we loved yeah doing it was that. such an experience. He um, explained to me how to hammer yeah, correctly we, and listen to the sound. He was, was, he was forever the teacher. Everything that came out of his mouth was teaching, oh. teaching, teaching. And oh, even in that short time, I learned so much. And even the children, like he had the children. Yeah. There were some great pictures. I don't have them. Um, someone else took them of the children sorting the shingles. Like yeah. they always, like there was always just something to and involve you knew what them. Tasks to give everybody so yeah. everybody was involved. Um, and so this is where this is where we were at that yeah. point. Um, we had the year and the land was just uh, that. weird. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had done some things to figure out. We we spent a lot of time figuring out these things. Um, one I should actually another big influence for us was when we were in New Hampshire there was in the middle of winter there was a five day power mm -hmm. outage um, and because of our home there was a fireplace our house was so we were useless. <laughs> we were trying to like heat it with the fireplace but it was a fireplace that was clearly purely aesthetic and there was no, you like you'd be huddled right next to it and it wouldn't be warm you couldn't use the water the toilet anything for Nothing five days worked. and it was just yeah. our generator really that we had just in case that scary. happened didn't work yeah. So uh, nothing so worked, and, and Caden was young. He was yeah. like, we got to the point where we were starting to be like, do we need to start worrying about this? You know, our house was getting cold, and we did not want that to ever happen again. We just felt so helpless. So one of the things that we discovered, we saw, heard of other people using hand pumps. So like, well, we can do that while we live in the fabric gear, and then we have that for um, in case anything. So we set up. Um, a hand pump um, because the fabric here it was just basically a tent, you know, fabric here it didn't have any um, systems. And then we had to figure out firewood, which is a whole new thing for us. Um, we put in a wood stove and again had help because that we didn't know how to do that at all um, and learned how to chop firewood. And then for the toilet, we read the human or handbook, which again was like, okay, we can do this what, to get through until we get to the big house. But um, I fell in love <laughs> with human <humanure. laughs> um, just because it was like pure magic to me of like basically taking waste product and like turning it into fertility. And, um, you know, we use it on our, our trees and um, it's just, um, and like things grow in it, like there's, uh, it's a, you know, steam coming off it. Um, and eventually later we ended up building an, an out here. Um, but inside there was a little, we made a little nook, because um, we did have the small children. So one of the first things Josh built was a, the human or toilet. <laughs> um, and we could do build that. And we still pump our water. And we still use compost toilets. Yeah, but this was our initial setup. And so then we also had to figure out, like, okay, so how does water work here? And we would wash dishes outside, and then we would wash dishes on the table inside, and then we 
ended up with a bucket under the sink that we would take out. Mm -hmm. And then Josh had to figure out like counters and everything, just the and, round space. And, and the round is not easy to build in, <laughs> especially with these support posts. These are called snow supports that go up and they're every, I don't know, 18 inches. And they make almost impossible <laughs> for someone who doesn't know anything about carpentry to build. <laughs> everything was really, really crude, but it all worked. It all worked, and we were quite cozy for the one year we were going to live there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and it did, I think it really did work too because the children were so small. They were like, oh, come on now. And so um, they also used to have two gigantic playrooms in our previous home, um, which, uh, yeah, and this was our little play area in the year. That's all they really got. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, wait, we have two big playrooms? Um, but it, it all it all worked. Um, and we did baths in the tub by the fire. Um, and then Bill gave us a cut list for what we would need. So, for the so year. along this time too, um, this is a good time to talk about Bill's encouragement. Bill was really good at kind of encouraging you to just push your limits and try 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 it. Like, what's wrong with trying out something? And um, so we had discussed having somebody bring a portable sawmill to our property and having the wood milled right there. And we were like, great, that'll be great. I can't wait to have, we had all these beautiful spruce trees. And then, and I, I'm, I don't know how many of you live around here, but trying to get somebody to do something like mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. is impossible. <laughs> the, the person that everybody gave me the name of, who I won't, say, just in case everybody knows this person, was like, yeah, I could get to that sometime, maybe six months from now, and then, like, it was just, we kept, like, calling and trying to contact the person and get more details, and we never got calls back, and we couldn't find anyone else with a portable mill that would come and mill our wood, so we decided <laughs> to buy a mill with a friend. And do it ourselves. And again, I had I couldn't even really read a tape measure at this point. I was, le <laughs> I, I was learning like I could do the fractions. I'm really good at math, so I look at it and I do the fractions out. But a tape measure was still kind of new to me. And my friend also had a need for a sawmill, so it was definitely economical to buy one together. And it, we just made the deal that I would get it first, so that I could mill the wood for our home. And so we bought a portable sawmill, and I had never done any sawing at all, and I learned how to do it, and you'll see some bigger lumber piles. <laughs> <laughs> and then the sawdust um, worked great because we could use it for the toilet yeah, as it's well. Yeah, so it created for our this toilet, old which we still use today. Um, oh, and then this is just sorry. There's a lot of. <laughs> This is the inside of the year. As we got, as we were getting, Josh was milling, and we were getting set up inside, and um, we finally kind of figured out what worked for us in the, in the small space. And we were in it for four years. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was also. This is my home office, um, and that's so I often would end up at the library, um, trying to also juggle that um, very important. This piece. picture is her actually working. <laughs> <laughs> With a little yeah. monkey on her back. Um, and then we went through the winter, and there are many people like, we, please come stay with us. That most people did not like think that we should or could um, go through the winter in this, um, but we did. Oh, we it was did. a kind of a doozy of a winter, and um, it was it was fine. Um, and this is Bill um, also. You really encouraged carving. I'm pretty sure that's where you started. So yeah, so yeah. Josh started many, carving. Many of the visits out, um, most of the time we went as a family to visit Bill. Um, but there were a few times that I went solo with him um, just to go out and have a quick visit with him to talk about the plans of the year or an update of, of what we were doing. And he, he was always, you know, and again, when you see those pictures of us in our old life, he would just pick up a knife and just start carving and wood chips would be flying all over the floor and like I'd be like, Oh, where's the vacuum? Like what's he doing? He's making a mess and, and just, it, just opening your mind to like it's okay to like carve wood chips on the floor and clean it up later. And um, so I was introduced to carving through Bill and you know, we had so much wood around and 
you know, the plastic was starting to get to me and still gets to me. Um, so some of the toys we started making were out of wood. And knitting. And again, this is, you know, me fitting a sock on an Aria that I knit. And, um, that's how we spend a lot of time. Yeah, so there. we no longer had any TVs. <laughs> um, and Yay. so we, yeah, so it was a whole new, like, what do you, you know, we, we have all this time, and what do we want to do with it? And we were never bored. We were never bored. Um, but we did, so Josh milled, and then we ran out of, we ran ran out out of logs. Hmm. Um, we, we wanted our clearing to be a certain size, and then we ran out of logs. So my brother-in-law taught me how to use a chainsaw better than I knew how. I knew how to use a chainsaw, but I didn't know how to fell trees collect correctly. And he is a logger, so he taught me how to drop trees, and he came up and he helped drop a lot of the trees you see here, and we worked on it together, and then we had a friend come with a tractor and haul up more logs to the mill. And then we were continuing to send letters back and forth with Bill, and um, also continuing to visit with him. Um, and that's Kenneth, that's down below when we appeared at this visit. He, there was a whole school trip that was down there, and Kenneth was showing them how to um, make a bowl. And um, there's always something going on. Um, and so we, we kind of watched that, and then um, later Bill brought us upstairs, and we just um, talked with him about what we were doing. That's him, like pulling out a quote from his book. And he said, I never read this before. Maybe I should read that. <laughs> and um, and the, the kids just really, like, very quickly were very comfortable there. Um, it just is, so, yeah. Um, and then our children were getting bigger, and <laughs> so we had to figure out a new bed situation, and so we had to figure out Josh figured out making a triangular bed that would fit in a little yurt <laughs> and a little bed for Aria below and, and Bill had suggested um, because I think it was quite clear quickly how I had no carpentry skills <laughs> that I should I, we were talking about this timber frame uh, course mm -hmm. and he thought that I should take it I was like I probably won't go because we're not going to build a timber frame and I wouldn't be able to help out and he suggested going just to get familiar with being in a shop and the tools and different stuff and how to use a tape measure. And um, so I, after that, I timber framed this bed. It was the first thing that I timber framed. It's a trapezoid and and Caden slept in it for quite a few, actually the whole four years we yeah. were there, Caden slept in it. He, <laughs> yeah. And um, underneath was a trundle that came out for Aria, but it always stayed out. <laughs> And then uh, also at this time, um, I started to get permaculture forced because we had to figure out like what we were going to do with the land once it didn't, you know, have all the logs mm -hmm. and everything. So, and also our water, our pump was artesian, our our well, mm -hmm. and so we had this like constant runoff, and and below our property was just this big muck area, and we had to figure out um, what to do. And I put that John Seymour book there because I had it and my teacher at the time said she had visited him in England and uh, um, and he had told her he said you know I actually had it all wrong it, it should not be self-sufficiency people are meant to be doing these things together okay. and that was a, another big piece yeah. of us that piece for us that um, it impacted our later choices um, and so then we started making little bits of garden right next to the little yurt because that's all we could do at that point. Um, and then this is just another, we kept going out to Bill and this is just another visit. Um, and then, so at this point, um, we had sold our house for a lot less and on this visit, um, I, on the way back down the trail, um, Josh turned to me and said, you, you look yellow. And so um, we got back home and um, we ended up realizing I was really sick. And um, I came with a tagline of, if you don't treat this, um, death within five years. Thing. And, um, and it was all conventional, like really yucky stuff. And um, we weren't comfortable with, with what that was. And so we ended up going um, alternative and finding another way, but it also used up a lot of our resources to do that. Um, 
Um, but it, but that was more than five years ago and there's no sign of it at all. So it, it was worth it, but again, it was like time and resources um, juggle, juggled in. And also at that exact same time, <laughs> we had... Um, we had moved all of our stuff out of my mom's house for lack of, the, the quick way to say it is we were having kind of a falling out and we wanted to be as far away as quick as possible. <laughs> but we got, a, we got a storage unit right close to our property and we put everything of importance and value into that storage unit. And we'd already really downsized so, so much. We had that, that 2,500 square foot, but yeah. we, we were like, okay, these are the things that are really important. And then... It burned also, down. Also, yeah. It burned down. That same week. No, oh, the visit no. and the diagnosis, and then yeah. then we, we drove up to get our like summer clothes out, and as we drove up, actually, Caden's like, "What's that over there?" We don't there? Need to tell the details. Of but still, it, it was just like out. crazy, and like so we watched it like just burn, and um, but I feel like that was also um, um so then we went to see Bill. <laughs> And, and Shortly after that, and like everyone that we talked to was the same as you just said, like, oh, you know. But uh, when we mentioned it to Bill, he said... Bill, Bill without <laughs> missing a beat, says, everybody needs a good burn every five years. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I wish this place would burn yeah. down so I could build it again now. Uh, when I walk I down the trail, sometimes I hope that it's burned down so that I can build it again better. <laughs> And so it was just one of those days. And it, you know, and he's right. Like this, that was what year was that? That was five years ago. Two thousand three. Oh. Yeah. And none, none of that stuff, none of that stuff we care yeah, about. Yeah, we have there's like, very specific I things mean, we realize at this point, but but yeah. most of it we didn't need. Yeah. We, we lived so we just fine. Really we're just all okay. It. It's not better today <laughs> right. than we were then. What what was in the little gear was all we had oh, left at yeah. that point. Um, so we continued with the milling. We were planting garlic and castine, and um, and it was hot milling in the summer. So the pump became a. I had a, a, I had a leather neck that summer. year. <laughs> and um, we also we had built an outdoor shower, and Josh built this out yurt so that we had the outdoor space. Um, so that was his first experiment with building building a yurt himself. Um, and then we were starting to. Um, really build up the wood from the milling and the lower left is where our wooden ear is, was planned to go. Um, and then um, August of 2013 we had our first sleepover out at Bill's. Um, we'd always just had day trips before mm -hmm. and um, that's the guest year over on the right and has anyone stayed there? Well, I've, I've been there. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so it has all these quotes up that I just love to see and at this point I, the guest year is listing a little bit but we <laughs> still love that's where we love to stay um, mm. one, and little, one little thing I'll throw in mm. is a lot of the quotes are, are poems by Emily Dickinson mm. and it took yeah. me until seeing that to put it together that's about Dickinson's really yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a big fan of Emily Dickinson there's <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. some great stories he has great stories about <laughs> Emily Dickinson I don't know if you can see that, but um, it's have nothing in your home, house, home, that you do not know to be. Can you read it, Josh? No. I don't know. It was a good one. To be something and believe it, and, and to believe it to be useful. Not know. Beautiful. Beautiful and useful is, I mean, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, and. So in these visits, so like we're there and it's not just hanging out and talking, it's like we're doing things. Okay, so this is the project. He was building a new yurt um, that either he was going to maybe have as his like old age yurt or like if so, if he ever needed help, it would a be a caregiver. Stay. And so we were um, working on the door and working on, on some other pieces of it um, while we were there and using the shape horse and that's the platform for it and the children and Bill said this like every time like the adults are involved in something the children like naturally want to be involved in doing something and, and they they want um, and then and then eating together um, 
and then we would talk about our plans, which our plans were just on a big piece of paper that he that he um, kept there. Um, and then we were getting further along on the wood, and these bottom pictures are really just because our, our refrigerator died that summer, and we because <laughs> I. I you know, we had no resources at that point to replace the refrigerator. We were straight out. Yeah, yeah, and so, again, we, when it came up with Bill somehow, he's like, good, you don't need it, because yeah. you didn't have any such thing out there, so. Um, coolers and yeah. trying to keep them out of the sun. And, and then, um, so then this is another visit where the yurt's a lot further along. Every time you went out, you would really use the people who came through to, to move the projects along. You always had something in mind, and, and this trip, we didn't even know it before we went there, but um, he needed the roofing, and he had to canoe it in. So when we got there, <laughs> he said, we're going to go get the roofing. And um, so they... Um, this is how Bill brought all of the lumber out to build his yurt, you know, was, was a catamaran canoe like this. Um, he would go twice a day on the tides, um, whenever the tides were right, didn't matter if it was two in the morning, but he brought all of his lumber out. Um, there was a place, I don't remember the name, it doesn't matter, but he would have the lumber brought there, he would bring catamaran them over, and it's quite a ride. It's There's some open ocean over a pretty big bay, and it, and it was, um, it, it's, it was hairy, <laughs> you know, in the fog, but he knew exactly where he was going. And it, this is him, um, him and his good friend Zoni, who would, 80. She's yeah, 80 now. Yeah, she's old. three years. He was like 83 and she was 80. Yeah. And they canoed back with this <laughs> giant pieces of metal. And we, yeah, we're like sending them off uh, in, no. the, in the fog. And, and yeah. everything worked out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, so we're trying to build the gardens, filling more trees, pulling up trees. And the lumber's um, building. It's November now. And we go out to visit Bill. And, and we're at, at this point, um, with us is one of the students from our children's school who would ask Bill to be her ment mentor for his uh, eighth grade project. Mm -hmm. And um, Bill had not said mm -hmm. yes. He had given all these reasons mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to pay a teacher and things that mm -hmm. seemed really, really odd to us. Yeah, yeah really we're like, he had really taken us in and it seemed like such a positive thing mm -hmm. to be able to influence this 14-year-old mm -hmm. this, um, girl. girl. and. So we all went out there together. He said he really wanted to meet, and he had us actually tie these little twig bundles together because Scott Nearing had used them as fire starters, and he wanted to give it a try. And so that was the project that he had us do that time. And when we left this visit, um, the girl told us when he said payment, she, she had a meeting with him. When he said payment, he meant like, Food. A loaf of bread and some, because they had a and greenhouse and they grew green. So he like said he agreed upon teaching her how to, she was going to carve her own, uh, she was going to make her own knife and then use that knife to carve her own dinner set. Plate, fork, you know, knife, yeah. spoon. And he said the payment would be a loaf of bread from Tenderheart and some greens from your gr greenhouse. Mm. And it was really eye-opening for us because he didn't mean payment. Um, he, he just meant teachers need to be compensated, to be an and we didn't realize it. But we brought food every time we came out, and we were paying, paying him. Were and he, yeah. he recognized that, it, and we hadn't even realized that that was already happening in our relationship. Um, so it was a really good um, lesson for us. Um, so we came home from that. Um, oh, actually, so then... Josh did a yurt symposium. Bill yeah. had a yurt building yeah, he symposium. Did a, he did. This is the only time he's ever actually done any um, like workshop that was just basically telling the story of his yurts and how to build them, and some of the math behind it, um, and the history of how he got kind of what we're saying here. But it was his history of how he took the Mongolian yurt and changed it to make the tapered wall here. It was a five day, I think it was five day class, and there was eight of us there. And it was some of the best days I've ever had, and it was by far my best days with Bill. Um, just really um, immersed in yurts and you know learning about how to build them and ev everything about yurts. Um, Cause obviously we're, we're fans of the yurt. Um, but then um, 
a couple of weeks after that visit in the symposium, um, we got a call from um, Kenneth and Angela, Kenneth and Angela Kenneth again. Um, that um, there had been a car accident um, when Bill was traveling to their house for Thanksgiving, and that um, Bill had Bill had died. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so we traveled to our family for Thanksgiving, and then they told us to come up that Sunday after we were all going to gather up at Dickinson's Reach. And, um, and this is this this is this funeral casket that they canoed across that same canoe that I was just telling you about. And they carved they they made the casket yeah. out there, um, and then brought it across the same way that we brought the roofing. They brought it across to to where his um, body was, and they canoed yeah. canoed him in. And it's quite a walk. We all there was many. There's probably 30 people there yeah, at that point. Yeah, 40 and of we, us. We we walked his casket up and buried him. Walked it through each, you know, each area of his, and, of, yep. of his land, and um, and then we met all these wonderful people that we'd heard about. But then it felt like, you know, and and I would say too, it's ending. another thing for us, just our process of, you know, we just grew up so mainstream, and so this is the way things happened. And you know, you died, you either got buried, you got cremated, and it was, you know, there was a funeral was a very certain it was thing, just and how it happened, and. This again opened our eye to wow! You can you can do something different. You can kind of have a celebration of somebody's life. And at the end of it, the forty of us were in a circle, all sharing an experience, a quote. And Emily Dickinson quotes were all getting put on his casket before it was lowered, and then we all shoveled the clay. <laughs> the people that dug that hole. Oh my goodness! It was all clay after about eighteen inches, and uh, but we all buried them together. Everybody took turns with a shovel. And um, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever taken part of. Um, and I just never knew that a service could be that way. And it was just, we really were just thinking that you, we, we were starting to really be um, more open-minded about everything in life, not just living in a roundhouse versus a square house. Um, the influence of Bill and the Narings was really um, taking hold of us at that point. Um, also, um, Mike, who we had met at this um, re-roofing, the Good Life Center yard, he was also there, and pretty much everyone there knew the situation that we were in. Um, and well, Mike took yeah. the plans that yeah, were I had, on I had walked Bill's up desk. to him and asked him, um, you know, is, you know, this isn't the right time, but I don't know when I'm going to see you again. Is there is there any way you'd reconsider leading our yurt workshop? I mean, at this point, you saw the lumber piles. We were almost ready um, mm -hmm. to build, yeah, I mean, and it was, the, the, it was it was interesting that the the, the yurt plans were right on top of the desk, and um, and one of the members that of the the people that actually owned the property now said it was okay. They didn't want anybody to take anything because there was a lot that had to be sorted out. But they said Mike could take the plans and look at them. And Mike brought the plans home, and he said, "I'll I'll go home and I'll look and I'll see if I can do it." <laughs> was was what um, he said to us. So we went home and we kept going. Because um, we, we, we just knew it, it had to happen. I mean, it yeah. had to happen like, somehow, some way. <laughs> and Josh kept learning how to carve, and um, and so we were going through winter again. Um, and then um, in January, a couple months after the burial, Mike gave us a call and said he, he would do it. Um, and so we went to Vermont, and he lived in a little gypsy wagon at that time. And um, and Nika was pregnant as his wife. You know, they're younger. They, they had Mike had traveled around with Bill for about five years um, on your builds, and and then so so he had some of this knowledge and so we were going over the plans and making plans from there and then we, we set the workshops in place and things were just full steam ahead there and this is just we were making things trying our you know handcraft in many ways and so we finished milling the wood and then we had to start planing <laughs> at all and so most of those piles go back one just well for a yeah i think we need to so up a yeah bit down. most of this wood needed to go through this planer <laughs> before we could actually put it into our house and so then having mike like he used he sketch up google sketch up you know he was really um 
relying on you know different different ways to to make sure because the, that is that was the you know plan was three to your year and this is <laughs> this is our very not technological way of sticking stakes like I think it should go about here in the ground right there um, and so then we we had an excavator come and try to like. They kind of made some walls, and we made a pond based on that runoff to try to catch all the um, the water, and um, co created the spot for the for the platform. And we continued trying to make gardens and cleaning wood, and and then we had a friend. We had to figure out this. We decided on a cement slab, and Bill was super excited about that. And a friend at school was like, I love cement, <laughs> and wanted to help us figure out this 24-sided um, oh. cement platform that we needed to make. And so he walked Josh through all of the steps of how and to this do is it. Where, and you can keep going, but this is where our community really started to support us in a way that was a, just an incredibly beautiful thing. Um, I mean, he donated his time. I think in the end of it, I gave him a snowblower for showing me how to do all of this. Um, and that's a 46 foot um, diameter. You know, this is not a small space. I mean, and he said there's he was 180 pieces of rebar in that. Um, I mean, it's just an incredible three truckloads of cement to just make a seven inch slab. I mean, this is a lot. He um, said he was paying it for too, right. like that he had gotten he had a lot of help, help in his when house. He built his house. Um, um, Know, we're gonna run out of time I know. <laughs> but but this, and people from our school our community came and just helped I'd never done cement so he got grab, grabbed the crew and we poured the, the slab and then um, we were getting closer we, we were planning on an August workshop and we were just finishing up um, and finishing the planning, and then we are getting ready for the workshop. Um, this is a dish rack that was food super and important. And <laughs> the dish rack, and, and and with more people, we needed another bin on our humanure bin. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and we borrowed tents for to have a place to eat, and we had to make campsites in the woods for people to come um, sleep in. And uh, again, we hadn't been here very long, and we were asking people to come for two two week workshops and um, we didn't have, yeah, which is a, just a crazy thing and most of the people that really delved in were people who really had a connection to Bill and it was almost more like a, um, Tony. Tony and Warren, um, who, and Jimmy, and who, who had known Bill or, or, or we met in the community. There. Yeah. And, um, we also got letters from people close to Bill, um, helping tell us what to do about food, helping encourage us to... Um, and, and these are the people that, and I think it's worth saying, that are part of our Dickinson Street community now, that are just incredible craftspeople, and they just, they encourage us still to this day, and everything they do encourages us. Like, this piece of paper that he sent this letter on, he and Bill had traveled to Bhutan, to make, learn how to make paper. And this was a piece of paper that he and Bill had made a bet together while they were in Bhutan. And he sent this copper yurt with that to us. Wrapped um, in birch bark. Wrapped in I mean, birch bark. so oh. beautiful. Um, so they just really are inspiring people and they really pushed us to, to you know, go as far as we can. Um, and so then the first day arrived and people showed up. <laughs> And um, Mike walked us through <coughs> what we were going to do, and um, and people came and helped with the food. I hadn't really <laughs> understood at all what was going to be happening with the food, and it just we just kept making food and um, and being told like which you know M Mike just directed us basically on on what we were all doing and so many people had no idea and what I think to it, do. I think it's worth saying or too, most of the tools we were using at this point were hand tools. Um, we, Bill, Bill said that hand tools were important to so a yurt build when you're building with community because then you can hear people and talk to people. Um, the one thing that he did um, sanction was uh, drills because you, know, you, you can't screw in, you know, a couple thousand screws like this, and he thought that the uh, the hand drill, the power drill, wasn't that loud, and even quieter than hammers. Um, but we so did use the table saw. We did, use, <laughs> we did use the power tools a little bit further away 
um, it's hard to tell the distance, but we moved that all away so that the people that were down working on the yurt could still hear each other. Um, and that's Mike in the middle of the night trying to figure out things on the computer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we doing? Um, and then these are just pictures of it going up, and we would really kind of meet at certain times, and Mike would, you know, explain things and divvy up projects. And this is really the community at its finest. I mean, we had, we're guessing, I think, over mm -hmm. 60 different people have helped us build this structure. Um, and, yeah, so much food. I mean, one person even donated a whole lobster dinner <laughs> for him, because Josh turned 40th 40 birthday during, happened, during one of the workshops. And then also, there would be a break in the afternoon. There's Tony. Um, and, and people like Fritz here, he um, was showing us how to make hand brooms. And um, so it wasn't just is really, you know, it, it, it was just craft has become a big part of our life now. And it was, even then, it was really becoming a big part. And then that's Josh often a lot of stuff was on the fly like we th we thought we had all the supplies but then you would get to this point where like that's Josh like calling EBS or something and trying to like figure out something that we needed um, and that's Nika Mike's wife and she was there helping and, and the children were often doing their own like building <laughs> projects in parallel I've got to say that watching the kids play down at that pond was just one of those fun, inspiring things while we're up there sweating or <laughs> <laughs> and splashing and just having a wonderful time with that. You know, this is so, so as she clicks through, one of the things for people that haven't built yurts, um, especially multiple story yurts, that's really interesting is you actually need to get to the top and build the yurt from the top down. Um, the, the platform, we, have to, we did the first floor well, this is really the first floor. The second floor platform, then we built the third floor platform, and then we could start making the walls and the roof, because they all come off of each other as it goes down. Yeah, so that's the second. And so um, during this workshop, um, Joanna was like the <coughs> oldest friend of Belle, and she was there. She's this beautiful, beautiful woman. and. Um, while we were building this, she fell through the hole where the stairs are, and she broke her collarbone. Um, and so this was all of some of us in the yurt, just like in that moment, um, and she went to the hospital, and she insisted on coming back. <laughs> and she slept in the yurt with us that night, and she was like, it's, I don't know, I can't even explain how. Yeah. None of these paths, this path isn't straight. <laughs> yeah, and then people would just show up with like bread and chickens and peaches and um, and it got built. Yeah, and there's Joanna. That, that was this is where we were at the end of the first two weeks. Um, you know, and then yeah, there's Joel at the top with his trumpet. Yeah, he was a, yeah. he was one of the stewards here, and he came and helped, and he did a fanfare <laughs> progress we were at that point. Um, and that was the, most of the end of the first workshop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the second workshop where. Well, we actually, this is still the first one. Wow. And so, yeah, that's making sheaves. And so, this is where we were at the end of the first one. And we had this picture of Bill up during it. And this, this was in August. This was in the first two yeah. weeks of August. And then our second workshop was in October. And, you know, we had thought that we'd have all these people. And um, October was a little different. Yeah, um, we had a hard. skeleton crew. Um, less people could make it for a variety of reasons. And, I know, but um, it's just getting late. Yeah, and we had to push really hard to get as far as we did. But it was, again, it was a wonderful experience. Um, yeah, and there was a lot of time inside, you know, it was darker, it was raining and cold, um, and, and it made us a like tighter crew, like we would come, we, you know, there was a break day, and we came home, and everyone's in the yurt, and this is it, and the bottom, and it, it was just like total um, in it togetherness, um, and it was really hard and beautiful at the same time. Many of those people are, are considered family for us now. Um, yeah, and Aria helped a lot. 
because Kaden was at school and it was, it was just a whole different, lots of people were sick and couldn't help and, um, but we, we did it and we pushed through right to the end and I guess we had thought we were going to be pretty done <laughs> when we were done with the workshops, but we were not. No, this is the close. last day, we were, you know, pushing, pushing, pushing and friends set up a dinner for us and they made dinner for everyone. Um, and that's and that still plastic night. on the windows, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot to be done. That was in two years before we moved in. Yeah, and so then all these beautiful people that we connected with went home and it was just <laughs> us yeah. left to carry it forward, which I, we learned later, like, was kind of Bill's intent was like, I'll show you what to do and then you, you mm -hmm. figure it out from there. Yeah. Um, and, and we did. So this was... And I got better with a tape measure. Yeah, and we were, but we were still in the lily art and would be for a long time to and come. And this picture is hard to see, yeah. but this was yeah. this was the hardest one to work on it. <laughs> but this is me sledding <laughs> all the way down <laughs> and because there was so much snow. Um, and one of the biggest things we had to do was roof it. And at first we were gonna do a metal roof, which Bill was excited about, but it didn't work. It was just ridiculous. So, so I shingled reasons. it. So we had cedar shingled it. <laughs> and it took me three months. Yeah. Um, and again, we didn't get much help. So I, I did that all Yeah, we summer. just pecked away at it. Yeah. Um, but also in our last workshop, mm. the people that were close to Bill mm. and had his, um, were responsible mm. for carrying his land forward came to us and asked us to be part of this group, the Dickinson's Reach community, to help mm. steward the land. Um, and so it started in that following May, where we were part of this group that would come together and do projects and, and really think about and um, to carry his land forward. Um, it's and then just we kind of a picture of the different finished. communities, like you know how how important community is to us. The community that helped us build this, Bill's community, and our community here, also so important to us. So we finished that, we built the chicken coop, and finished putting in the windows, the windows, 81 windows. The windows all had, to, um, they didn't get, they couldn't be custom made for each space, so they were trapezoids, and each floor had the same size. Um, and the way a yurt works, you have to put the windows in from the outside, so we had to figure out how to make stops. We'd get out and Melanie would push the window as she'd start to slide down the roof. I would put the caulking around and then put stops in. And we had to do that on all the all the upstairs windows. And then we still had um, walls to move downstairs and the floor and um, there was a lot of sanding. Then built the staircase to the third sand. floor. Mm. Um, yeah, there's just all kinds of pieces that we still needed to get in place and the plastic that was left there were opening windows and we had to figure out how do you make an opening window on this and um, that he timber framed a bathroom area and all of our staining and then he figured out making windows which was a whole new thing mm -hmm. um, and and they work and then that's, that's completely so they awning outwards just to finish that mm -hmm. they awning out mm -hmm. instead of slide or anything. Mm -hmm. That was how we came up with it. And then we put in um, Josh's grandfather's cook stove. Great grandfather. Great grandfather's mm -hmm. cook stove. And we before we could move in we knew we needed something on the top of those stairs and so Josh built this bookshelf into a desk. Um, and there are the windows and putting in the first floor. And then Kenneth um, came and helped us figure out a cupola. Um, or get us started on a cupola, yeah. and then we needed to take it the rest of the way, and it sat there for a year. Um, and this is that's our children's growth thing on the little year over there, <laughs> and us outgrowing the little year yeah. um, as we were trying, trying to push in to get into the year, and also we were continuing to extend the garden bit by bit. And that's friends coming to help stain it, mm -hmm. and us us staining the floor, um, and then that's. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, us moving in, yeah. <laughs> moving in, <laughs> in December of 2016. Um, and one of the first things that happened is the children making a wall between their bed spaces. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was one of the first things we did. Was also yeah, everything has to be built, like the walls, like everything. Um, and so 
these are just some pictures of, in, of in building Bill's things In book, out. I think, he said, you know, a man's house is never done until the man dies. And I didn't really understand that when I read it for the first time. <laughs> and uh, now I truly understand that because I just sit there sometimes and I just think Crazy. of thousands mm -hmm. of projects that I have left to do. And I'm okay with it. I'm at peace with it now because we live in it. And I don't have to get us in it anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was quite a journey to get into it. Um, I'm sorry, these are, can't actually see that, but, um, so the little yurt, we now had this empty little yurt, and um, we cleared it out, little beds and all, and we ended up renting, we, we rent it now, um, because we, originally we were going to get rid of it, and we, we use it all winter long for our own purposes, and then we rent it in the summer, and at first we weren't sure what that was going to feel like, because that's from our house to the out to the little yurt, it's pretty close. But um, it actually has been beautiful because many people come and they um, are able to have their eyes opened in a similar way that we were able to have our eyes opened. It feels like a little bit paying it forward. Um, and so that's where we are now. And we continue to go out to Dickinson's Reach um, in, sorry, these are all on top of each other because this was me throwing pictures in. <laughs> and um, we just also still have this really strong connection to, to Dickinson's Reach. Um, Bill's land. Our kids do as well. They've been going there for a long time. Yeah. yeah um, that in the middle, it's Caden and two of the other community members, they built a raft um, out of scraps that they found up there and they still mm -hmm. They sailed it through the tide <laughs> rip, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it didn't flip. We were all like, just waiting for it, <laughs> um, and that's just the you know where the wooden area is now. Yeah, and some of this is some pictures of the, the inside mm -hmm. as we live in it now, um, mm -hmm. and that's just the land. And, and another another thing we do. Do you have pictures of our? Are you keeping going? Yeah, so this is a picture, um, we're almost done actually. The um, Peter Forbes came and did a memorial talk for um, Bill after he passed and in it, um, Peter had this picture, I don't have it, of uh, Bill um, stand up paddling with a big lobster boat behind him. And Peter explained it as um, every day Bill needed to make the choice. To, to be who he was and to, to continue to live that life. He, it had to be a conscious choice and that really sticks with us is because sometimes it's it's hard to like, especially with a family, <laughs> and to, to try to stay true to how we want to be living. And um, so one, one of the things that evolved um, in January of this year, we started, you know, well, we call it Sloyd Sunday. And Sloyd is a Swedish word for handcraft, to be handy. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a few people, including some of Caden's classmates, um, a young girl especially, um, had asked me about carving because I have become the handworks teacher at their Waldorf mm -hmm. school, the assistant mm -hmm. handworks teacher. Mm -hmm. So I help teach the grades, knitting, crocheting, mm -hmm. basket making ankle weaving, all this stuff. But the one thing I don't do at school is teach woodworking. Mm. But what I do is sit out at recess every day and carve a spoon. And many of the kids really like that. Mm. And they are very curious about it. So we started a Sloyd Sunday where a few of my friends and this young girl, um, I could show them what I've learned so far, which isn't a lot, but it's more than they have. And um, we get together and we carve every Sunday. And it's kind of evolved. Um, sometimes we have 30 people there. And um, it's all people getting together. We've had spinning wheels, knitters, crocheters, you know, um, many different things. Yeah. Sewing. Made lamps and herbal things. Kaden and, and his sewing. friend. You know, sewing machines. And we a lot of us carve spoons. And um, it, it, the, the love of craft is just so important to us. And um, that inspiration from Bill, um, we felt like we had to kind of pay it forward um, and, then, and create the space for this to happen. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we started working with Birch Bark, which is another thing that mm -hmm. I've learned from our Dickinson's Reach community. And um, 
in this space behind it, and this is the last slide, um, and below it, um, what we're working on now is a greenhouse, and we're actually using the nearing book. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be stone and glass and wood, um, and it's not going to be quite what, what theirs were, but it, that's, you know, the inspiration of it. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really great.